Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Nagashima of Fish uh, University Department of Applied Chemistry and Aisna, uh, WPA Aisna. And first of all, thank you very much for joining this seminar. Uh, today, we have a very special guest from uh, Korea, uh, Professor Hassan Kim. Uh, he is a professor at the uh, Faculty of Energy System Engineering, Big uh, Gyeongbuk Institute of Science and Technology, or uh, DIGIST, Korea. So, uh, as you see in this uh, catalog, uh, you recognize that uh, you receive his uh, Bachelor of Science in Seoul National University, and uh, then he moved to US, uh, University, USA, uh, University of Illinois at Urban Champaign. Uh, this is our uh, satellite, uh, WPA Aisna. And uh, he's, uh, he got a PG with there and uh, come back to uh, Korea and work at Seoul Univers National University for long. And at the uh, last uh, several years, uh, he was a vice president of uh, Seoul National Uni University. And uh, for what? Uh, about four, three, four years ago, he moved from Seoul National University Seoul to uh, Daegu uh, Digest, and, uh, uh, not the Digest, D Digest, Digest. And uh, as you know, uh, uh, he is a very famous professor in the world, and actually he uh, we are friends for a long time, and uh, we met uh, many times in. Uh, National meeting in the uh, world, including the US and Europe. And uh, today he, he, he will give a talk entitled uh, Preparation of Catalyst Players for Enhanced Performance in Low Temperature Fuel Cells. Professor Kim, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Nakashima, for your kind introduction. And it is uh, really my great pleasure to visit Kyushu University and also uh, Eisner uh, for the first time. Kyushu University, of course, I visited this Ito campus maybe nine, 10 years ago. And of course, I visited the old campus uh, many uh, times. But anyway, I'm very glad to be here and to share some of the work on fuel cell. And the title is here. And you know, I, I have been known uh, World Premier Institute when it inaugurated in Japan many, many years ago. And I was asked to review the applications of different universities and NIMS in Tsukuba. And it turned out to be uh, all very uh, excellent. And Kyushu University, of course, is uh, uh, doing very well. And today, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, DIGIST first. And you know, when you watch TV, there is a uh, you know advertisement before the main part, <laughs> and so this is part of the uh, advertisement, and this is and introduce our department. Then I'll go into the main part, main body of my talk, <coughs> starting from hydrogen economy, so to speak, and pure cell work. I was asked. I was asked to focus my talk on pure cells, and so I'm going to focus on pure cells. How do we prepare the catalyst layer to improve the overall performance? Then this part, the major issues in pure cell research, it can give to young students a rough idea, what is the, the issues, and what is the problems, and how those problems
values should be uh, attacked. And preparation method, uh, I'm going to introduce what triple phase boundaries are. Then we specifically introduce the electro or chemical uh, deposition of catalyst on GDL itself. And I'm going to introduce mainly on platinum ruthenium uh, co-cap alloy by electrochemical deposition. And we did platinum and also we did platinum cobalt, but I'm going to skip that part. I'm focused on the, uh, this part. And then I'm going to talk about the carbon support a little bit because uh, many people are working on various type of carbons and also carbon nanotube is one of them and Professor Nakashima is the one of the expert uh, on carbon nanotube uh, from fundamental part to the application part. Uh, but this time I'm going to focus on the uh, rather physical property of carbon in terms of pores which can facilitate the mass transport of the fuel cell reactions before I close my talk today. Heatist. And located in Peru, perhaps you know KAIST, and some of them know GIST. And this one was uh, established about 45 years ago. The government uh, intended to nurture the high level science and technology manpower for the development of our economy. So that was 45 years ago. And this one got a very big attention because the government had a very good uh, supporting system for KAIST students. And at that time, I was in the United States, and many top-level students, uh, not to continue to South National University as a graduate student, but they moved to KAIST. One of the main reasons was its full fellowship. They supported everything plus exemption from military duty. That's a very, very big point. So that's why top level students go to KAIST. Then about 20 years ago, they established another one in the about 300 kilometers south uh, west of Seoul called Guangzhou. Then 20 years later after this one, they established similar one at the other part, the other side of the peninsula, about 300 kilometers south east of Seoul. So we have now three different uh, further institutions. So this one also get a similar support as KAIST did, including military duty and full support. You know, each master student got almost uh, now Japanese yen is a rather uh, strange situation, so it's going to be very favorable. <laughs> it's, it's something like uh, ninety ninety thousand yen per month. Is it ninety thousand yen reasonable, or it should be nine hundred? 90,000 90, per month per master student and about uh, 1,100. 1,100,000 000 yen for PhD students per month. No, no, no tuition. No tuition, no tuition. They don't have to pay tuition or supported by government. And they stay in dormitory and we pay them <laughs> in the dormitory. Uh, three times a day. So this is a very good support from the government. And research-oriented graduate school opened about 
to almost three years ago. And first master student graduated uh, last February, only 18. So we are focusing on the quality, not the quantity at all. And undergraduate students will start uh, this March. And we already selected 200 undergraduate students. And we only have the concentrated efforts on MIRE brain, we call MIRE brain. MIRE is in Korean means future. <laughs> so it means future brain, but M stands for uh, Material, emerging materials, and then information, communication, robotics, energy systems where I belong to, and brain science, and new biology, only six departments, and details. So I'm going to introduce our department, okay? Vision. Global Leading Convergence Energy Department. Core Technologies for Renewable Green Energies. Education for Creative <coughs> r and Capabilities. We only have eight full-time faculty members. Postdocs only two at the moment. PhD candidate 20, master 25. So it's a rather small department at the moment. And major research areas is starting from the sun, but so that you can imagine what it's going to be. Goes to using solar energy to convert carbon dioxide to thin gas to fuel, or it goes to direct production of electricity using Disensitized solar cell, quantum dust, organic photovoltaics. Then it has a, a micro biofuel cells. Then from this electricity, storage devices, so batteries. And also use this light source for water splitting. Water splitting to produce hydrogen. This hydrogen can be utilized as a fuel cell. It generates electricity or drive vehicles. So this is the uh, basic structure or basic aim for our department. So I'm going to introduce just briefly, just scan through the, uh, the full-time faculty members. Uh, battery and material discovery laboratory. He is working on post-lithium ion batteries. So you know Perhaps the limitation of lithium ion battery is you cannot utilize it very much for vehicular applications. You know, it can go to about 300 kilometers at the most. Uh, lately, Tesla introduced, they claimed about 320, but they have more than twice as much lithium batteries underneath. So they are utilizing only one third of it and it moves to this, to this, so that it can go longer than any other uh, the electric vehicles uh, like a Volt or Japanese cars. So he's focusing on post-lithium ion because that's the basic limitation of lithium ion batteries. The capacity is not allowed for vehicles driving more than almost 200 kilometers. So new inorganic materials for post-lithium ion batteries. And he's also working on uh, lithium ion batteries and working on the electrochemistry, new energy conversions, and she's also interested in post lithium batteries. And uh, Sangaraju Shamugam, uh, he's from India and he spent several years in Waseda 
university before he joined to our department. So he can speak some Japanese as well. And he's researching advanced material for PEM fuel cells, cathode metal air batteries. So metal air battery is, say, half fuel cell, half batteries. <coughs> and electrochemical biosensors. And he is interested in the membranes usable for low humidity fuel cells and bifunctionalized, bifunctional cathode for uh, zinc air batteries. And this is the, uh, the youngest uh, addition or the latest addition to our department, Professor Lee. And he is interested in advanced energy conversion storage labs. Energy conversion device, low temperature solid oxide fuel cells to develop the oxide down uh, conductivity, high oxide down conductivity even at low temperature. And also with state batteries and also metal air batteries. And he, Professor In is interested in CO2 conversion to pure photocatalytic water screening, <laughs> solar cells, film, film solar cells, disensitive solar cell or cadmium zinc tin tetralide, uh, sulfide, and microbial uh, energy uh, engineering systems. And uh, another uh, Professor Lee is interested in organic photovoltaic devices. So it all focused on this organic photovoltaics, which at the moment has efficiency of very low percentages, but the price and the flexibility perhaps sometimes can compete with uh, current technologies like uh, uh, silicon or thin film photovoltaics. And multifunctional nanoparticles. And here's a design nanowires, metallic nano uh, crystals, hybrid co shell nanocrystal crystals, semiconductor nanocrystals, which can be utilized for many applications including chemical physical property, basic properties to photovoltaics, fuel cells, then the other part perhaps is not uh, directly related to the energy systems. The two application for his uh, research is hybrid organic inorganic solar cells and all inorganic solar cells. Of course, the inorganic solar cells uh, should exhibit a uh, longer durability or longevity compared to the organic counterparts. Then finally, uh, uh, Professor Han is uh, first principle computer calculations. So he can provide very fundamental aspects of thermodynamics. Then fuel cell catalysts, lithium metals, and nuclear materials, which can be applied for applications in energy systems. Then, I don't know whether this is appropriate for me to say this to you, but we are inviting top class faculty, postdoc, and students in our department of these areas. More details can be found here, or where you can send uh, applications for faculty positions. Well, then I'll move to the main body, hydrogen economy. Hydrogen economy is a definition that the society is based on hydrogen, not fossil fuels. We already know that the current culture or current living of ourselves at the moment 
is very much depending on the energy supply of fossil fuels. Uh, almost 95% of the total energy is supplied by fossil fuels, but we know that they are depletable. So we have to prepare for the post fossil fuel times. That's what we call hydrogen economies. And the most important part of hydrogen economy in my mind is technology dependent. When you consider the oil, you know, few countries in Middle East have most of the reservoirs and they have the big power and they can earn a lot of money because they are born in a country where a lot of oil reserves underneath. But people like Japan or Korea who do not have much in natural resources as far as the oil and coal is concerned, then this hydrogen economy is very attractive because as long as we have technology, then we don't have to worry about the geological dependent fossil fuels. Pollution free, no carbon, no global warming. So it has many advantages. So we have to focus our attention to these points to prepare the after fossil fuel era. Synthesis, perhaps uh, students uh, may uh, have some problems to understand this, but reforming Reforming is the hydrogen containing compounds like methane or propane, which contains hydrogen. So we can extract hydrogen out of these carbohydrates. So using the catalyst to convert this thing into the partial oxidation of these compounds to produce hydrogen. And electrolysis, of course. You know, electrolysis from you know, uh, primary school or junior high, you learn how to produce water by electrolysis of water. But it costs a lot at the moment. Solar energies, semiconductor, photovoltaics, which utilize solar energies and catalytic reaction, catalytic splitting of water to oxygen and hydrogen. Storage. Well, oil, it is easy to store or transport, but hydrogen is gas. So it is a little bit tricky to store or transport. In order to do that, at the moment, about 300 to 700. At the moment, most of the automobile <coughs> companies utilizing this 700 uh, atmospheric pressure tank, which can contain a lot in a given volume. But this is, this is more than a bomb, really. You know, gas tank in the laboratory is almost, what, less than 100 atmospheric pressure, 2,000 pounds per square inches. But this is almost 10 times more power than the laboratory gas tank. So the safety problem is uh, one of the major problems. Metal hydride. Compound hydride. This compound hydride is very easy to extract hydrogen. You just add water into it, produce hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen is a very cryogenic, very low temperature. Even carbon nanotubes, 
maybe maybe he's working very hard on this to utilize this for uh, hydrogen storage use. Pure cell. Uh, well, I believe uh, many of the students may already know what pure cell is. Isn't it right? Students, so I don't have to explain this. Why pure cell? You know everything. I guess. All right? The as I mentioned before, there is a big competition between battery and fuel cell for automobile applications. And the automobile is such a device which consumes consumes a lot of oil. Do you know that about 60% of oil is used for transportation, including automobile, airplane, train. So transportation is one of the big end device to eat up all these oils. So that's why there is a big competition between pure cell and batteries. And many years ago, pure cell seems a little bit far, but these days, batteries and pure cell is not as popular as batteries at the moment, the last couple of years. And then, due to the limitation of this battery for vehicle applications, more countries including United States and Japan and many European countries are focusing a little bit on this pure cell these days. And wide application, cellular phone, notebook, residual power vehicle, and power plant. The structure is shown here. Hydrogen goes in, oxidized to produce proton. Proton moves to cathode where oxygen is re being reduced. In order, to re re in order for this oxygen to be reduced, it needs <coughs> protons. So proton has to come across this. When the proton across this, that means electron goes like this, right, to different charges. Okay, then for theoretical thermodynamic calculations for oxygen reduction and hydrogen oxidations, theoretical potential is almost 1.2 volt. But in real application of pure cell, you never, you never get more than one volt even at very low current flowing, even at very low current flowing, immediately when it operates, drops due to the kinetic aspects of oxygen reduction reactions. And this is what we call the activation loss. Then there is a ohmic polarization resistance to resistance uh, of the whole system consumes a part of it, then at the end, concentration polarization, the supply is limited at very high current densities. So that's one of the, that's the uh, fundamental limitation of fuel cells, okay? <coughs> then, I'm going to talk about the major issues. It is more like a, a kinetic part of the problems. The first one, of course, catalysts. You have to have a suitable catalyst which has very low activation energies. When it turned on, it immediately drops. So we have to have a very low over potentials 
But at the moment, platinum is the most popular catalyst or platinum-containing alloys. Then, oxygen reduction reactions for hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. When you are talking about direct methanol fuel cell, direct methanol fuel cell is oxidizing methanol instead of hydrogen. Still, we are using oxygen. But the oxidation of methanol is even more sluggish sluggishier than the oxygen reduction reactions. So in DMFC, oxygen um, methanol oxidation catalyst is more important than oxygen reduction catalyst. Low temperature operations. The PEM operates under 100 degrees. So catalytic activity is pretty low compared to solid oxide fuel cell, which operates more than 650 degrees. As solid oxide fuel cell, you don't need too much about the catalyst itself because temperature is very high, the activity is very fast. Then long-term stability. Long-term stability or durability is another big issue in fuel cell applications. So many people are working on this part. Membranes. And membranes, membranes is the media where proton transporting from anode to cathode. So nation or of Japanese compound of acai chemicals uh, produce DL membranes, which is basically a similar structure for uh, hydrocarbons. And, but the cost is very expensive. And organic polymers, you cannot, you cannot let it go more than 120. So there is a, a compromise. You have to have a high temperature, but the membrane cannot stand higher than, say, 110, 120. So there has to be an activity to improve this. Then the activity follow these high temperature operations. Water management. Most of the this uh, membrane Proton conducting membranes require water molecules. So hydrated pro proton, proton, hydronium ions. So you have to have water management. When it's dry, then conductivity of proton decreases very rapidly. That means overall performance is very low. Support, I'm talking about carbon. This fusion of catalyst, of course, is very important because catalytic reaction occurs at the surface of the support. And also, the transport of chemicals. In the beginning, I was mentioning about the core structure or core structures of carbon support, which provides mass transport through this. And some people, some people will use uh, uh, carbon nanotubes for enhanced movement of these chemicals through this. But carbon itself has, is uh, rather a porous material, but depending on the pore size, some movement of the chemical may or may not utilize these pores. And I'm going to talk a little bit on this matter in the later part of my talk. Of course, carbon corrosion. Long-term stability. And that's why some people utilize the metal oxide. And 
other part, bipolar plate integration as a whole system and fuel management, hydrogen social infrastructure, storage safety. All these parts are included in the fuel cell issues. And I'm going to talk about catalyst a little bit and carbons. And the other part is I'm not working on this very much. Okay, technology evolution. In last, say, 30, 40 years, fuel cell catalyst, starting from carbon-supported PT catalyst, of course, that's a very natural starting point. When you have a catalyst, you have to have a support. Then very inexpensive support material and also uh, electronic conductive material is carbon, activated carbons. High surface area, very good conductivity. So that's a, a very reasonable starting point. Then, then people came up with the idea, how about removing, removing this carbon? So neat catalyst. But it turned out that stability is not very good, activity is not very good. Then it moves to the random alloys to prepare to reduce the amount of platinum. Then the activity turned out to be pretty good. But the problem is the transition metal is rather easily leached into this electrolyte. Then it, the activity decreased. Then core shell. So have a whole platinum outside and some inside transition metals. And it worked fine because platinum covers completely outside. And there is an electronic interaction between core metal and shell of platinum, which act favorably for decreasing the deviant structure Maybe students do not know what the event structure is, but uh, at the moment there's an electronic property of the electrons which controls the bond energy of oxygen absorption. Then hollow without any core substrate, just have a hollow shell. And from this to this, we have re reduced the amount of platinum significantly. Then at the same time, why not, why not find uh, other than platinum catalyst? That's why ruthenium came up, but ruthenium is more expensive than platinum. Then ruthenium selenide, palladium-based alloy, even palladium core platinum, that's what uh, Professor Nagashima's group is working on. And very lately, carbon alloys, but carbon alloy is not proper wood, but you start with the carbon or carbon nanotubes or even graphene and remove some of this carbon with nitrogen. Then this nitrogen may have some catalytic activity towards the oxygen reduction reactions. Or you introduce some transition metal on this and have enough activity and enough stability for the catalytic application of this. I talk very much about the alloys. And I said the deviant structure, deviant, and it has a volcanic shape with different alloys. And also, this determines the binding energy of oxygen. When oxygen absorbs very strongly on the surface, then perhaps in the beginning, it is a good catalytic activity. But the binding energy is so strong that it cannot remove. Then overall, catalytic activity is very low. And if the binding energy is very weak, then it comes in, go away even before the reaction occurs. That means also reaction rate is very low. 
So have to have a, a suitable binding energies. A strong enough for chemical reactions, but weak enough for removal to refresh the catalyst site. OK, the triple case boundary. This is a very uh, uh, catalysis 101 class type things. So you have to have a catalyst, and you also have proton conductivity as well as electronic conductivity because fuel cell reactions, oxygen reduction reactions, hydrogen oxidation, methanol oxidations, all involves the same number of electron and proton, same number of electron and proton, same number of electron and proton. That means in order for these reactions continue, you have to have suitable electronic conductive conducting material for removing this or supplying this. And also, same time, proton conductivity. It removes the proton or supply protons. That means the catalyst layer with a suitable electron conductivity, that means carbon can provide this very well. And carbon nanotube, graphene, which has a much better conducting substrate, produce higher activities. And also, at the same time, proton conductivity, you need ionomers, so nature polymers. So the catalyst with carbon, nature together acts most actively for the fuel cell applications. So chemical deposition, electrochemical deposition part. Generally, what you do for preparation of catalyst is I have prepared this for the Bellman uh, process, which is a colloidal reactions. You start with uh, nanotubes, and since the nanotube is not very sticky for metal ion adsorption, you have uh, introduced these uh, colloid shares of the catalyst. If there's a little platinum or platinum alloy, or platinum ruthenium alloys. Then there is a, a, a surfactant shell outside. This organic part is easily adsorbed on the surface of carbon nanotubes. And after this, you heat it up to remove these organic shells away, about 300, 350. Then organic part go away. Then metal part remain on the surface. So you have a very good homogeneous explosion of catalyst on even carbon nanotubes. Then after that, after you prepare this catalyst, you mix up with carbon and make a slurry, then apply on top of the gas diffusion layers. Then it ends up like this. But many of these platinums are buried underneath or is not act as a triple phase site. That means they are bad catalysts. They are not utilizing for pure cell breaker. Only some part, perhaps in this uh, black part, are active phases, and the others are non-active parts. So we developed new method for electrochemical deposition. Electrochemistry occurs only at the surface. Okay? Then it looks like this. So the utilization for platinum site should be much greater than this one. But there is uh, two problems. First, Gas diffusion layer is hydrophobic layers. Hydrophobic means the water cannot easily be in contact with the surface. That means electrochemistry in aqueous media does not occur on hydrophobic surface layers. So it has to have some problems to be solved for this hydrophobicity of the gas diffusion layer. And the other second part is, after you deposit your uh, platinum, 
they tend to be uh, amorphous in nature. So the catalytic activity is very low. So you need heat this catalyst about 250 to 300 degrees to have a reasonable crystallinity of this catalyst. But when you have this in Neptune, Neptune cannot stand more than 100 120, 130 degrees. So there are two problems. So we have to solve these two problems. First, by hydrophobicity, we make have a spray of the hydrophilic layers containing, uh, I'll show you that, the grease, napion, and carbon and spray on top of the glass layers, then it will, the surface going to be hydrophilic. The second part is the, the natural high temperature problems. We solve this by transforming protonic form of napion to sodium form. <coughs> that can be done in a, a electrochemistry, electrochemical deposition of platinum occurred in a solution containing sodium chloride, sodium perchlorate. Then this natrium is very love to be exchanged with sodium forms. And the sodium form of natrium can stand about 300 degrees. So after you this, but the sodium form of natrium is of course not protonic conductive at all. So after you heat it, what you do is you put it in a sulfuric acid solution for a few minutes, then all this sodium reach the way, then it return back to protonic form of natrium. Then we are ready in business. Hydrophilic. Hydrophobic layer, this one, hydrophilic layer, carbon, natrium, glycerols, and use this. We just spray this, then hydrophilic surface is very easily obtained. Then electrochemical deposition, and I'm now talking about the platinum ruthenium part. And platinum ruthenium co depositions, the standard potential is different. So you have to control the concentration ratio to end up with suitable atomic ratio of platinum and ruthenium. Okay? So we uh, checked the cross uh, section of this. Uh, catalyst layer and turn out to be ruthenium part, platinum part. So they are very uh, in good parallel fashion. So we have, we do have a co deposition of this. And particle size, a different concentration ratio of platinum ruthenium, about 3.5 to 4 nanometers. So that's a suitable or good size of particles. Then unicell performance. Unicell performance is we utilize this for pure cell applications. Then polarization curve is measure the current density with the potentials. And the black one is ETEC with the same amount of platinum ruthenium. We have the same amount of platinum ruthenium in ETEC catalyst as well as the electrochemically deposited ones. We carefully calculate this and make these two different MEAs and compare these two MEAs for fuel cell application. The red electrodeposit platinum within, it has 0.1, about 0.1 milligram platinum within in per square centimeter, which is pretty low. And as you can see, at the same potential, the current increase is more than 35%. So that's one of the examples of what we did. Then we expose this to the hydrogen containing carbon monoxide. The one of the big problem in pure solar applications, especially in uh, DMFC, is the uh, poisoning of platinum with carbon monoxide. The binding of carbon monoxide to platinum is so strong that the catalytic site is dead 
after when it exposed to uh, a gas containing carbon monoxide. This is so, no? This is a 10 ppm carbon monoxide, and this one reduced this. This one, the original EPEC catalyst, reduced to this. And when we increase to 100 ppm, of course, both are almost dead. Then, after this, we compare the recovery. After exposing this carbon monoxide, we try to how they are returned back to the originals. And this and this is original, and those uh, uh, 10 ppm, 100 ppm of this, this is the same for this. Always, always electrochemically the projected ones return back. I mean, it doesn't return back completely to the original. Some, some site still contains carbon monoxide. But as you can compare to this, it always turn out to be better than the EPEC catalysts. This is uh, due to this uh, bifunctional uh, mechanism proposed many years back by Professor Watanabe in, in Yamanashi University. And so when we have an electrochemical deposition of co-deposition of fractinum and ruthenium, perhaps the proximity between these two atomic catalysts turn out to be better than the commercial catalyst. So that bifunctional mechanism works uh, favorably on electrochemically deposited surfaces. Okay, the carbon support. Why do we need carbon? Uh, that's a, a good electronic conductivity, but me also mechanical stability and durability. And different kind of carbons, including uh, activate the carbon vulcan nanotubes, and it also should include uh, different mesoporous carbon and graphene as well. And, and this is another old uh, work that the different carbon perform different catalytic activity with the same catalyst. So there is a big role of carbon. Depending on the interaction between catalyst and carbon, the overall performance depends very much on the carbons. And carbon black, primary particle surface looks like a, a graphene part and distorted is uh, uh, different type things, but it always forms uh, obligate forms. That's what normally what we observe. And agglomerated forms uh, like this and different uh, sizes. And graphite type carbon, including graphene. Multiple carbon nanotubes, single whole carbon nanotubes, uh, carbon nanofiber, different carbon nanohone, fullerene, Nano capsules, they, they, they are all different kind of you know, graphitic types. So it takes uh, very high energy to produce these graphitic type carbons. But many people are working on this, also working on this, and now the production cost is uh, much lower than when it first introduced. And when the preparation of this uh, carbon material, graphitization goes to this way, high temperature and crystallinity goes into this, and crystallinity over increase this, and surface area increase this way. So at the low temperature of carbon, it has a very high surface areas, but when it goes down to this, surface area decreases, but conductivity and the uh, crystallinity increases. And porosity, and this is the third time I'm mentioning the porosity due to the, the transport of the reactant is also important in pure cell reactions. And carbon nanotube, carbon nanotube is of course is the diameter is in the order of angstroms, tens, hundreds, less than hundreds of angstrom, which is very, very small pore sizes. But the bundles of these carbon nanotubes 
the between this carbon nanotubes, there is a secondary force, which is pretty big size. So that's the, where the reactant pass through this. And we tested the different carbons, carbon multivolt, cat and black, Vulcan, Vulcan, temperature treated, acetylene, black. The crystallinity is go like this. Of course, carbon the nanotube is even higher. Then we measured surface area for volumes and for diameter distribution. And this is 100 micrometers, uh, 100 nanometers, and this is a 10 nanometers. So that's a very, very micro force of this side, and this is a meso force. <coughs> and when you see this cat and black, cat and black has a very good fraction of micro force. But carbon nanotubes, and the multiple carbon nanotubes, almost no micro force, but it has a very big fraction of mesopores, okay? And this carbon structure is important when we are working on direct methanol fuel cell because oxidation of methanol is very, very sluggish. That means you need more catalyst. So when you need more catalyst, then catalyst layer is going to be very thick. So the mass transport is quite difficult. So in order to overcome this, you increase the metal loading. That means 40%, 60%, 80% metal. But when you compare, say, 40%, 60%, 80%, even to 90%, comparing to 80 to 90%, only you think catalyst increased to about 10%, but, but the amount of carbon which determines the thickness of the catalyst layer, from here to here, you reduce the thickness by half. See, the 20% carbon, 10% carbon. So carbon is much lighter than platinum, so it determines the whole volume. So that's why we increase this much. Then this thickness of the catalyst layer is dramatically decreasing by increasing the metal loadings. Then, of course, the morphology is almost the same, but when we, you have a 90%, then you can see all this platinum is agglomerated. You know, so they stack together. So that means the utilization is not very good at all. And one of the first part to test the activity and surface area, electrochemical surface area, is the CO stripping. So exposed to CO, then electrochemically oxidized, how stable, I mean, how active they are. And this is the stripping peaks. And Electrochemical surface area, 90%, this, this, this. You can see the electrochemical surface area of 90% is even less than 80%. That's due to the agglomeration of the catalyst. And reference factor, of course, higher metal has a higher degrees. Then, half cell test. Half cell test is perhaps many people compare this half cell test to judge the catalytic activity of the catalyst that they developed. And when you see this, the pink color, 80% cat and black, blue, 90% cat and black. So more, more metal, but the half cell test is slower. Compared to same 80% for this, Vulcan, acetylene black. The surface area is, for this, is smallest, higher, higher. And this uh, the pink one is the same, and the, the cat and black has the highest surface area catalyst. But you remember, first one is Vulcan, cat 
in black and Vulcan 80% and acetylene in black. Then when you test the pure cell test, the first thing come out 90% ones, then Vulcan and the other two come out almost same. Okay? To compare, half cell test, cat and black, acetylene and black, but pure cell test, they come out almost the same. Why is that? The surface area of acetylene and black is much small compared to the cat and black. And that's why, that's why the half cell test showed higher activity for methanol oxidation at cat and black catalyst. But pure cell test, they are almost the same. It's a similar thing. For diameter, normalized cumulative areas, and we all catalysts are normalized because the, they have different surface areas. So we normalize the same, then we turn out to be cat and black has a very good fraction of micropores compared to the multiple carbon nanotubes has higher fraction in the mesopores. And same as the absolute pore volume turn out to be similar fashion like this. That's the one of the reason why you have to compare the pure cell single single cell test, not half cell test in electrolyte. Electrolyte containing aqueous media. This is the electrolyte sulfuric acid media. When the surface area is very high and very minor pores, there is teeny little pores inside. When you prepare the catalyst, they tend to be go into this. But in half cell test, all these catalysts are utilized for the half cell test. But in solid electrolyte, natrium, natrium is not as easy as water going to these micropores. That means some of these are dead catalysts. So they are not utilized by single cell tests. So that's why single cell test of this is very much different from the half cell test done in aqueous media. And I, I think that my time is almost up. And since many people are very much interested in graphing, I perhaps use the next three minutes. Is it okay? Yeah. The graphing. Graphing is uh, such a wonderful property. You know, graphing. Graphene is like a carbon nanotube. You cut along the tubes and you open this. So you just imagine what graphene is, okay? Strongest bond in nature, surface area, carbon nanotube of twice as that much. Uniform electronic properties than any other carbons. This is what physicists like the most about the, the graphene. And chemists like this, excellent electron conductivity, and has heterogeneous charge transport reactions. So that's why graphene can be easily utilized for sensor applications. Then, the, one of the main problems of graphene for pure cell application is they are not staying as a single layers well separated singles. They tend to be stacked together. That means surface area of the fuel cell application is not as much as the single graphene nanosheets. So, how about introducing Vulcan with carbon nanotubes? No, 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 the, the graphene sheets. Ass ass we can assume that if the 
Vulcan carbon, activated carbon, stays in between sheets, layers of the graphene. Then you, we can utilize all surface areas, and we have enough channels for mass transport. So that's why that's why we prepare uh, this structure. Okay. Then actually, this is the morphology of uh, the graphene and. So you can see this is a very rough surface. And when you have a graphene, uh, same images, I'm going to show next, it's very flat. And also by AFM images, sometimes you have this much, about 1.5 nanometer. And the, the graphene stacking is about 0.3 nanometers. So this is perhaps due to this huge Vulcan activated carbons in between graphene nanoseeds. When you prepare graphene ruthenium or graphene, it is very smooth and not much graphene ruthenium can be anchored on top of graphene. So it looks like, well, theoretically it should be look like this but actually it isn't. We imagine this and we do not know because there is no way we can observe how they are uh, located. But anyway, metanol oxidation with different uh, uh, graphene and carbon mixtures, it has a higher activity. So definitely we can separate some of these uh, graphene nanoseeds and turn out to be about three to one was the optimum. And same as this, onset potential, CO stripping, electrochemical chemical surface area, graphene with uh, carbon nanotubes, um, no, no, the graphene with uh, Vulcan carbon has a highest electrochemical surface area compared to platinum ruthenium on graphene, platinum ruthenium on carbon. So it, the surface area improves very much significantly, and also the onset potential, it occurs earlier than the other two cases. And so is the pure cell, single cell test. This is the three to one ratio of graphene and Vulcan, and this is e catalyst. This is platinum ruthenium on carbon, and this is on graphene itself. So turn out to be graphene mixed with activated carbon turn out to be uh, better. <coughs> and this is the, my final slice. And this is a house and this is automobile. And we need electricity, heat, and fuel for this. And this is one of the schemes that you produce heat, light, electricity by different methods and produce hydrogen, methanol, it goes to the fuel cell and at the same time, we utilize lithium battery, internal combustion engine, this is a hybrid car, right? And this goes to the storage devices to power our house and some of this goes, the electricity from here goes to this. And the main part is these techniques. So many young students should think about imaginations, how to produce this technique to either heat, light, electricity, or chemicals. So there are many opportunities for young students to work on this areas, I think. And summaries need for alternative energies, uh, platinum, platinum ruthenium catalyst prepared by galvanostatic deposition method. And catalyst mainly stays on the surface of it. And the loading is only one quarter to one eighth. The performance turned out to be even comparative or even better. 
and carbon support with proper foresight play additional role on the catalyst's activity by providing suitable channels for mass transport. And nanopores were not available due to polymeric ionophores could not go into these pores for suitable fuel cell application. That's the comparison of aqueous media and the solid, solid electrolyte medias. And platinum, ruthenium, graphene, vulcan carbon catalyst exhibit better performance than this. And could be, this can be, a composite can be utilized for uh, future uh, supporting materials. And those are the people working with me and some funding agencies. And I appreciate for your uh, attention. And these background photos are thesis photos. And this is academic part, research part, dormitories, gymnasiums, all in the campus so they can enjoy in addition to doing research. And I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.